Rich, please share your slides. Um, you start whenever you're able. Yeah. They shared. Yep. All right, we're going to get started here in just a minute. People are joining, so I'm going to wait just another thirty seconds or so. Um, because I still see people popping in. So we will start shortly. Wow, well, what a great turnout. Yeah, it's exciting. All right, we'll go ahead and get started because I know there's a lot to cover. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Empowerment Through Disability History webinar. I am Cindy Cipolletti. I'm the CEO of LDA of America, and I'm really appreciative of you all joining us today. Our mission is to create opportunities for all individuals with learning disabilities, and we've been doing this work for more than 60 years, so I'm especially grateful for our partners um, Emerging America and our webinar presenters today as they discuss how important it is to understand disability history and the disability rights movement in the United States. The webinar is being recorded. The link to the recording will be provided to anybody who's registered, so you can look for that link to arrive in within 48 hours or so. If you have any questions for the presenters, we will address all questions at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Um, please use the Q&A and not the chat for your questions. Um, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can use the chat for any technical difficulties and we'll do our best to help you with that. Um, I can tell you that um, our regular webinar tech guru is on vacation and so I am your substitute. Um, I'm about 25 years older than her, so I'm probably not as good at the tech stuff as she is, but I will do my best. So just be patient with me if it takes me a little longer than it, it takes the young people to do it. Um, and now it is my privilege to turn over the program to my colleague and friend, Rich Cairn. Thanks so much, Cindy. It is always a delight to work with uh, the Learning Disabilities Association of America. Um, we've been great partners on several projects together. Um, before we introduce ourselves, one other thing, um, if you would like to, to use the Zoom automatic generated closed captions function, there's a little CC button at the bottom of the page. Um, if you don't want that on blocking part of your screen, um, you can turn it off. Um, so this uh, webinar is Empowering Students Through Disability History. And um, I want to mention that in addition to our partners at the LDA, um, this work is made possible by a Teaching with Primary Sources grant from the Library of Congress. They've been big supporters of this work, and I can't say enough about um, how great that's been. Um, so I'm Rich Cairn, and I work at the Collaborative for Educational Services in uh, Western Massachusetts. And I come to this work of disability history um, in part because of my own experiences with mental illness and the experiences of family members and friends across my life, uh, people with disabilities. And I also come to the work because it is so exciting to share stories of um, disabled leaders who have uh, made the world a better place for people with disabilities. Ross. Thank you, Rich. Um, so my name is Ross Newton. I teach history at Heck Academy, a therapeutic public special education high school in Northampton, Massachusetts. That is um, part of the Collaborative for Educational Services. Um, and so I come to this topic from a, a couple of different angles. Um, I have a PhD in history, and so I've taught at the college. I've taught in public history, um, students of all ages, school groups, and now high school. Um, I also have uh, 20 odd years of lived experience with uh, physical um, disability. I use a wheelchair for mobility and uh, modifications, adaptations in order to live my best life. 
So we work with a lot of uh, other partners too. Um, I wanna share with you that we're going to share the slide deck from today with you. So you don't have to scribble down uh, URLs and so forth. Um, but uh, this lists a bunch of our partners um, and we you can look at the slide to figure out the other people we work with. So we are going to be talking about why it's important to teach disability history. And we're going to address what we call the long arc of disability history. So we're gonna talk about the disability rights movement, but we're actually gonna start 250 years ago and talk about disability advocacy all through American history. Um, we're gonna take a quick tour of the Reform to Equal Rights K-12 Disability History Curriculum. It's free online, we published it a year ago. Um, and we're actually gonna use a bunch of slides from it um, in the presentation, but we're also gonna take you to the website and let you see how to, how to uh, get into that and use it um, if you find it useful. Um, and uh, we wanna let you know that at the end of the webinar, we're gonna give you a few minutes to think about all of this information and what you can do with it in your setting, in your um, school or organization. And um, we are definitely gonna uh, make sure we save time for uh, questions and comments. And again, uh, feel free to put those at any point in the um, Q and A, um, uh, in the Q and A section. Uh, it's kind of like the chat, but we're using that instead of the chat for taking questions. All right, we wanna start off by asking you know, two big questions. I imagine if we polled the audience, um, most of you, the vast majority, would not have learned disability history in K through 12. Um, and so why didn't they teach me this? Um, and we, of course, want to make an affirmative case for why to teach disability history. So let's look at an image from 1942. Uh, Robert Hudson, as you can see, he's seated at a um, industrial machine. He's a defense worker. Um, the caption at the Library of Congress states that he has a disability, I think likely dwarfism. He later loses a leg to, due to an industrial accident. Um, and an image like this has the, the power to reshape a student's understanding of themselves, of, of history. You know, why didn't anyone teach me that people with disabilities helped win World War II, um, worked on the home front? And so through this curriculum, we make an affirmative case so that Disability history engages learners with history so that they can see themselves. It's more accurate. It's more inclusive. It highlights stories of people with disabilities as advocates, as Rich said. It addresses demeaning views, demeaning terms. You know, language really matters. Um, there are new, exciting, long overdue state standards across the nation. Um, and of course, students themselves are asking for it. So before we jump into this uh, tour of the long arc, uh, we want to highlight um, some young advocates from Massachusetts, uh, the Easter Seals um, Teach Disability History Team uh, in this short oh, three-minute video. Open your car door while submerged under... Teaching disability history is important because it empowers people with and without disabilities. The Teach Disability History Campaign Committee is made up entirely of young adults with disabilities, which is so important to the campaign because these are people who have passion for this project. The campaign committee does their work by doing presentations, both virtually and in person, and they can do that in schools and to educators and even people in the community to talk about why they think it's important to teach disability history. The goal of this campaign is to spread awareness around what disability history is. We want people from everywhere to show the message and raise awareness. I think it's important to teach disability history so people know that we are human too and deserve the right. Making sure people with disabilities have equal opportunities. So we'll have a more inclusive society. We can teach people who, who have a disability or who don't have a disability. To understand our differences and embrace them because they matter. 
to feel that you're part of a community and you're part of a movement. When we teach history, we're leaving out an entire population of individuals who have a very meaningful history. It's an often forgotten civil rights movement. And the more we forget about these types of movements, the more risk we are at having to fight them again. Even if you aren't part of the community, it's important to understand that there's another population of people that need representation and have their own culture and history. We want to encourage influence individuals in public and to teach disability history. Through education, we can increase access and just the overall general experience. There's still plenty of work to be done to make sure that disability history is taught in schools. They join us in this effort by sharing their available curriculum and resources to learn about and teach disability history. Hashtag teach disability history. Hashtag teach disability history. You have to teach disability history. Get involved. Use the hashtag teach disability history on all your social media. <laughs> So again, uh, the link to that you'll be able to uh, to see in the uh, in the slides. Um, so you guys are seeing my slides again now. Yes. And are they full screen, or you you're not seeing? They, them? Yeah. Let's see. Let me redo that. There we go. There we go. Is that better? Wonderful. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, so like Rich has said, we really, this curriculum and this work really centers the voices of um, young advocates. And so you likely have advocates just like that in your region. Um, and so there's a lot of really powerful work um, that's going on. So um, as Rich also mentioned, we want you to have some takeaways. Uh, one or two things that you can incorporate in your practice to uh, implement disability history. So here we identify four paths um, for implementing disability history. You can teach history directly like I do in the classroom. You can facilitate discussions of disability and identity and one-on-one, -on -one, small group or, or whole class. These are important conversations. Um, you can support integration in history and humanities through linking curriculum, the work that Rich has done. Um, and you can also advocate for school and district policy. So as you're listening, please think about those one or two takeaways that you can put into practice. All right, so now we're gonna dive into uh, a portion of the presentation where we are gonna be talking about and sharing uh, disability history. Uh, this slide comes directly out of the curriculum. There's some version of it at all different grades, and the curriculum truly is uh, K through 12. Um, so at those different appropriate levels, um, we introduce the idea that, okay, when you're looking at disability history, it's unavoidable to encounter some of these offensive terms and ideas. And so you want to prepare students in advance to be ready to, uh, to deal with that appropriately. Um, and uh, this is an example from one of our primary sources, the, um, the American School for the Deaf, which is a great school, still around today, was founded as the American Asylum for Deaf and Dumb. So if you're going to talk about the founding of this school, it's going to come up and you need to, to have a strategy and have students prepared to be respectful. Um, in our work, um, we use uh, mainly people first language because um, in our work, uh, that's what people have told us that they would prefer we do. We recognize that there's not unanimity in the disability community. And so different people are gonna have different approaches. What's most important, what's always important is to respect the choices of individuals and how they would like to identify. Um, and I'm gonna point to a resource here um, that can help teachers to know um, 
what uh, is the current language in use um, created by a group uh, called the National Center on Disability and Journalism. Okay, so this is our first primary source. Uh, primary sources are just the, the documents and the maps and the pictures and the things from the past that are evidence about what happened in the past. And so um, I'd like you to think about this uh, image. Um, what we do is we start by thinking, uh, having students just think about the facts. So a fact about this, not making guesses about what this is, but a fact would be, it's round. So uh, think about, uh, about this. Um, what else could you say about it? So commonly, um, people will say, you know, prominently, it says ADA, and then it tells you Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and there's uh, outlines of six people. And uh, at least two of the people um, are in wheelchairs, are using wheelchairs. Um, there's a person with their hand up. Um, and they're holding it, these people are holding a banner. So then we move on to saying, okay, well, what's going on? What, what is this? Um, and so uh, students would probably say that, you know, this is a political button. Um, and someone might know that the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1990, and they might even say that, but they might also ask the question, okay, what is it? And why would somebody wear a button? And we would encourage students to think about this. It's a, an engagement strategy to say, okay, um, imagine that you run into somebody, it's 1990 and you run into somebody wearing this button. What question would you like to ask them? What would you like to know? So maybe who made the button? Um, did, the, did this campaign work? What, what is this? Why were people supporting it? Some of those kinds of things. So using a primary source as a way of starting a discussion and an investigation is our whole point. This is a, a common uh, protocol that we take from the Library of Congress, this observe, reflect, question, and then go on to investigate um, and, and think about, okay, what was this Americans with Disabilities Act? What, what differences it made in the world? Um, and uh, we also use other tools like uh, sentence stems so that students who are struggling to, to come up with the structure of a question can just focus on what they want to know. So we say, you know, one thing I wonder about the button is blank because blank. So we kind of give them the form um, to scaffold their being able to ask questions. One of the things that we do in the curriculum is to help students understand just what disability is. Um, I love this top definition here. This is from New York City Public Schools. And it defines disability in terms of being able to participate in the community. And it says that a disability is when someone's brain or body works in a way that they may require tools or strategies to participate in the community. It is also important for students to know the ADA definition, which is the second one, and it puts disability in terms of impairment. Um, note that both of them include uh, disabilities that might not be visible, um, so mental um, impairments or uh, mental illness, as well as um, physical disabilities that one might see. Um, one of the things that the, the ADA definition does that's really important is to define disability in terms of limits to major life activities. It's not just about work, it is about work, but it's also about getting an education, um, having a family, going to a movie or going to the beach. Those things are all protected um, under the, the ADA. And it's also important for students to understand just how many folks we're talking about. Um, upwards of 60 million adults and another seven to eight million um, school-age students um, who have some kind of identified disability um, in our uh, country. So um, we're going to start looking at the details of history by looking at the moral reformers of the Second Great Awakening. This is the early, early in US history. And uh, a common question is, you know, where would people of disability, with disabilities have been 
in society? Well, most people, everybody lived on farms or they lived like if you were a shoemaker, you lived either next to your shop or not far away. And so most people with disabilities in the early colonial period and, and early American uh, US period, um, they, they were at home and there was something that they could do uh, to contribute to the family economy and, and um, contribute to the community um, there. But as the Industrial Revolution came on and more people are in cities, um, there's a growing number of um, people with no income. Um, people with disabilities usually ended up in um, almshouses or poor farms, poor houses. Um, and they were mostly run by their towns. Uh, this really lovely almshouse is a Quaker almshouse um, from the uh, 1700s. Um, so that would be another possibility is that your, your religious community might um, help take care of you. Um, so one of the things that began to happen, a great significance is in the early um, 1800s, there began to be institutions to support people with disabilities. So we already mentioned the American School for the Deaf was founded in 1817. And this is the first story of an individual that I wanna share. Um, Laurent Clair was deaf. He was a Frenchman who, he's the guy that Thomas Gallaudet brought over to America to start the American School for the Deaf. And he brought French sign language and then interacted with Americans and they developed what, what is today American Sign Language. It's a major world language. So this is the kind of story we want everyone to know so that they understand that people with disabilities have always been there doing the work to make the world um, more accessible. And there's a timeout slide that we use to say, okay, remember students what we're gonna do when we encounter these terms. Um, Dorothea Dix uh, was a woman from Massachusetts who um, she herself um, had mental health issues. She didn't uh, really identify as a person with disability, um, but um, she and um, uh, Samuel Gridley Howe founded the first school for students with developmental disabilities. And she did a major study in Massachusetts where she found that people with mental illness, um, if they weren't able to stay with their family for whatever reason, a lot of times where they ended up was in not just in a poor house, but often locked in the basement of the poor house or in jail. And so to largely get people out of those places, she became an advocate for um, what they, they called asylums. Um, which were hospitals for people with mental illness. And the original idea partly was to get them out of jail um, out of these horrible, horrible conditions that she'd found. But also um, they had the idea, these were smaller institutions than they later became. And there was a lot of care in them um, for the patients. She was so successful in her campaign to get states to build them and uh, to try and get the federal government to build them that she um, she uh, got Congress to pass a bill to support um, the building of uh, these hospitals uh, across the country, um, but it was vetoed by President Franklin Pierce on a state's rights argument saying the federal government has no, uh, no responsibility and should not in fact do anything to help individuals. So what changed? Well, the Civil War uh, brought uh, hundreds of thousands of um, injured people, injured soldiers. Um, and you'll notice in this image that it's civilians at the beginning of the war carrying the stretchers. And in fact, at the, at the beginning of the war, it was these same people like Dorothea Dix and Samuel Gridley Howe um, and other reformers who were the ones who initially set up all of the hospitals and so forth. So coming out of the war, one key development was that these disabled, these hundreds of thousands of disabled soldiers ended up changing how people thought about citizenship. It was a key argument used, as in this image, um, to advocate for um, Black 
uh, men to get the vote because that so many had been injured fighting for the Union. Um, and also by 1900, um, close to a million um, Union veterans and their families had gotten pensions. So the federal government had gotten into helping individuals big time. So as we continue on um, and get into the press progressive era, which is rightfully associated with many changes, um, regulations uh, in factories that are processing meat, um, breaking up uh, the monopolies of of, of, of um, organizations. Um, this era is a real low point for uh, disabled people. So progressives, um, they believed that government had a role in um, helping people to live better lives, to have more protections in the, in the workplace um, and other things. And so there were campaigns um, and the major progress, um, but at the same time, they're also um, in a work by people like Nellie Bly, a muckraking journalist um, centered in New York, who pretended insanity, spent 10 days undercover. Um, her report, it made headlines, it showed horrible conditions, but it didn't really, you know, change the situation. Um, if we look at um, a chart that shows institutionalization in the United States, you can see the residents in state hospitals. Um, just between 1900 and 1955, it increases fivefold. You know, zooming down, you know, closer to where we are now, there are still, you know, tens of, of thousands of people who are institutionalized. Um, it didn't really change noticeably until the 1970s. Um, and of course, there's a major court case in 1999 that, that Rich is going to briefly highlight um, a little later. So institutionalization was a defining moment uh, in um, U.S. history that needs to be taught. Another place where uh, disability intersects with, you know, kind of dominant narratives, commonly taught narratives of American history would be immigration. Um, here in front of you, you have a picture that's part of the curriculum of a medical examiner at Ellis Island, examining the eyes of immigrants. Um, he is looking for uh, trachoma, a highly infectious eye disease that was treatable, and yet it was you know, enough evidence to send people back. Um, and of course, this medical examination was, I guess, weaponized against um, non-white immigrants. Angel Island, a number of Asians um, who were sent back was much higher than um, than Europeans. If you look at this image and read it alongside the Immigration Act, it, it shows that anybody who is, quote, a lunatic or, quote, idiot, unable to take care of themselves or, um, or looked at as becoming part of a public charge, you know, should not be permitted to become, to come into the country. Uh, the eugenics movement um, was used to exclude immigrants, um, to force the sterilization of people in institutions. Uh, eugenics, a pseudoscience, um, a belief that um, certain traits are better. It was based on completely made up, uh, not actual uh, science, uh, but it was sanctioned at the highest courts. Um, Buck v. Bell, a 1929 court case, um, sanctioned um, sterilization, and it continued into the 1970s. Organizations uh, by and for people develop um, despite you know, all of these things during the progressive era. So if you look at the state of affairs for deaf schools in around 1900, in the United States and across and over across the world, ASL, American Sign Language, is under threat. Um, politicians and non-deaf educators were banning ASL in favor of oralism or reading uh, lips. And here we have George Vidis, president of the National Association of the Deaf, creating a silent film, an advocacy film, to teach ASL, and more importantly, to argue for the value how ASL unlocks you know, communication. 
non-government charitable organizations such as Easter Seals has have their start. As you can maybe notice, the um the the words are a bit problematic when we look at it from the 21st century. And so Easter Seals has changed its name, it's still there advocating. We have the American Foundation for the Blind founded to advocate for new tools. The Library of Congress um, creates a, a, a program for the, the print and uh, the blind and print disabled. Uh, a couple of years later, there's an American, um, found, uh, American Association of the Blind, an important distinction. We have veterans continuing to shape um, views and visibility of disability um, after the Second World War. We have um, an intersection of the dis of um, different uh, movements for rights. Um, here we have uh, parents' um, pamphlets, you know, your rights as a parent of a child with a disability. So in the 1940s and 50s, parent activists organize to fight for education. They file and win lawsuits, um, you know, before and after Brown versus Board of Education, which desegregates schools. There are continued uh, exposés uh, right after World War I, or World War II rather. Uh, Senator Robert Kennedy visits New York's Willowbrook and he finds the horrible conditions. Um, he likens it to you know, the treatment of animals in a zoo. And as we go into the 1970s, there are key court cases um, that lead to um, Expanded rights for students who are in, um, institutionalized, you know, a right to free education, a right to um, uh, statements that the state cannot define individuals who are not a danger, um, a right to safe confinement, freedom from bodily restraints, and it even leads to the closure of certain places like Penhurst, which was quite notorious. And then, of course, Olmstead, um, which uh, changes things. As we move into the 1970s, we really have the foundations of special education. Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which becomes the IDEA Act. Another foundational moment in the disability rights um, movement would be the, um, the 504 protests when protesters across the country um, and a group that sustained a movement, a sit-in for 26 days in the um, uh, in the Health, Education, and Welfare Office in San Francisco. Uh, here we have the words of Ed Roberts, we are no longer asking for charity, we're demanding our rights. Um, there's a powerful documentary about that, and that momentum really moves uh, forward to the, the ADA. And here we have an excerpt about the power of people joining uh, of dis with different disabilities joining together. The next picture shows um, civil rights activists and presidential candidate Jesse Jackson with a incredibly important disability advocate, Justin Dart. Um, we also have the buttons, right? We have popular support um, and that pushed uh, President Bush uh, to sign uh, the ADA in 1990. Uh, which bars discrimination on the basis of disability in employment, public accommodation, transportation, telecommunications. This really um, important act uh, continues to, to shape the landscape. So post ADA, what's been going on? We've referred a couple of times to this Olmstead VLC. LC is uh, Lois Curtis. This is uh, her. She's at the White House getting an award for her uh, dogged refusal to to let herself be um, confined when she did not want to be. And um, so uh, in 1999, uh, the Supreme Court ruled basically that you can't lock people up just because you define them as being disabled. Um, the only times you can lock people up are is if they've committed a crime or if there's really an argument that um, they're getting medical care. Um, that they couldn't get any other way. Um, the um, IDEA uh, changes the um, uh, education in 1990 um, 
you, our audience here knows uh, a lot about this, but we, we do want to highlight that this is the point at which a free, appropriate for all public education is something that is in federal law. And um, a number of uh, laws uh, adapt the IDEA over the years. Maybe the most significant is that in 1997, funding increased for it. So participation went from three to four million students um, to uh, seven and a half million students where um, close to where it is today. Um, and uh, just wanna mention in passing, of course, that uh, the um, uh, special education programs are still um, quite underfunded, especially by the federal government. Um, so um, this slide just summarizes those changes that are in the, in the chart. Um, and since uh, 2000, most of the changes have been uh, to the uh, law have been about um, making sure that uh, the services that students get are appropriate and, and, um, and so forth and tweaking those. Um, another thing that, um, uh, another area of work is uh, voting rights. Um, uh, estimates by people who really, really look at a lot of data on it say that there's somewhere uh, over 38 million eligible voters with disabilities and voters with disabilities are kept from the polls by all sorts of things from not being able to read the ballot, not being able to get in the polling place. Um, there's new laws that prevent people from being able to get help from someone to complete their ballot, which for some people, you know, they're just, they can't physically do it, um, or the, the ballot is not made available to them in a format they can. So there's still struggles going on there. Um, to back out a bit, um, we started by talking about what you could call a, a charity-based model of we're going to help these poor people and save them to a medical model across the 19th century and into even some folks still follow that model today, but that's one where people with disabilities are broken and need to be fixed or treated. But the dominant model of the ADA and of most disability activists today um, and of our society increasingly is that we're meeting the needs of people and that the, uh, the real barrier is the way people are treated. It's not the disability itself. Um, there's an increasingly developing identity model in which people with disabilities, um, like my friend Stephanie Polito here, she's got a sign that says Disability Pride Month. And um, so uh, people with disabilities embracing those disabilities and saying, this is who I am. And we'd like to encourage you to think about um, an emerging model of disability justice. Um, so looking at the social uh, model, uh, famous activist Judy Human said, disability only becomes a tragedy when society fails to provide the things we need to lead our lives. Um, and here's a, a young man embracing um, his disability saying, take a picture with a proud dyslexic um, so that sort of, particularly among young people, that sort of embracing the disability increasingly as a way to look at things. Um, Lydia X. E. Brown is the uh, person in this poster wearing a, a t-shirt that says disabled and proud. And um, uh, Lydia works to change society so that all people have equal rights and all people are respected. So um, as we move forward, I think I'll maybe quickly just summarize um, uh, the one slide, uh, two slides from now, Rich. Um, the need uh, for students with disabilities to see themselves represented in curriculum as active makers of histories. Um, you know, and all students as well need counter narratives that counteract negative societal views of disability. Um, as we know in education, um, adolescents, Students are developing their sense of self. They're trying on different identities. My students, they have IEPs, but they, they may not identify as having disabilities. But it's important that they know, um, that they understand that people with disabilities are more disabled by how society views and treats them. And then 
by what they can or cannot do. So um, I would like to, as I said, um, give you a quick uh, tour of the, the curriculum that we've been showing you bits of and uh, talking about. So our uh, main website, um, Emerging America is a program of the local education agency that I work for called, actually both Ross and I work for, um, called the, the Collaborative for Educational Services. So if you just go to emergingamerica.org, this is the homepage. And then there's a, a drop down menu for the curriculum. If you open up the curriculum, um, there's some description of how we got to this. I'm going to come back to that in a, in a minute here. Um, but how we developed it, there's some background on that. Um, and um, then uh, you very quickly see that uh, the uh, each of the seven units of the curriculum, there's 23 lesson plans across, as I said earlier, truly K through 12. And um, so you can zoom in on any one of these. I'm gonna mention that the Civil War unit, we had so much material that there's actually an online exhibit on, on that one. Um, but I'm gonna pop into one of these just to show you what one of the, um, units looks like. This is the grade six to eight civics unit. Um, and you guys are seeing that, right, Ross? Okay, so this is the ADAPT movement uh, photograph that uh, we use some of that story of the disability rights movement to explain civics, basic civics. And um, so we look at, uh, we introduce the concept of disability, we look at legislation, we look at what are disability rights, we look at the stories of disability activists, um, and the uh, court case, Supreme Court case of Olmstead VLC, Lois Curtis's case, um, a lot of teachers teach Supreme Court cases in eighth grade. So this model is kind of something that we're doing a lot, which is to say, you can teach a lot of the same things you're already teaching now, but inject these, uh, integrate these stories of disability in, into what you're teaching. Um, so I'm going to ve just very quickly show you, when you open this up, there are uh, Google Docs, so you're looking at the current version, um, and uh, they look like lesson plans. Um, they um, they have goals and and questions and and so forth, um, but I want to uh, go down and show you that one of the things that they do is to have um, all of the different primary sources that are used, and often there'll be some kind of handouts and so forth uh, for students. Um, and in the um, in the unit plans for these, um, there's actually. A, thumbnails of all of the primary sources used in each unit. So that's a really important tool for history teachers who a lot of times they want to write their own lessons. Well, we're, we've given them 250 primary sources they can use um, to write their own lessons. Um, and uh, Ross, anything I'm missing about the, the curriculum? I don't want to over rush it, but I also don't want to spend too much time just looking at a website. <laughs> he he teaches using this. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go back to our um, our slides. So you're seeing the slides again, right? Okay, good. So a couple of things about um, how we developed this. We had an advisory group of historians and educators. Um, and uh, some of those young people who were in that video that you saw from Easter Seals, Massachusetts, actually helped us review some of the materials and give us input on them. Um, we had a number of, uh, of people uh, from the disability community also involved in this. And the number one thing that people told us when, when we started to develop this is that we needed to focus on agency, on the voices and actions of disabled advocates for um, disability rights. Um, so we use a lot of primary sources. This is all inquiry-based. It's students pursuing their own investigations. We use universal design for learning throughout to make it accessible. And um, 
we offer opportunities for students to get involved in many of the lessons. And um, there's even one lesson that's just all about doing civic projects, civic engagement projects. Um, and throughout, the idea is that the whole class is uh, taking responsibility to make sure that the, um, that the teaching and learning is fully inclusive. Um, so I just want to show you a few quick um, tools and strategies. Um, again, we've been showing you examples from the curriculum, but this is kind of backing out a little bit. We do use universal design for learning, um, thinking about how to engage students, and then using, particularly using primary sources to give students multiple pathways and a lot of choices for how to access the ideas and then how to express themselves and take action. Um, every unit and every lesson uses UDL at the core of its design. We also include a cultural considerations component, which is, includes things like thinking about the language and how you're going to address that. Or if you're dealing with really uh, material that might be traumatic for some students, how you're going to address that. And you're talking about um, asylums. I mean, that could be traumatic for anyone. So you really need to think about how um, how to share those stories and the stories of liberation there um, without overwhelming students. Um, we say we use primary sources a lot and primary sources, and in this case, a secondary source, the best book on disability is called All the Way to the Top. Um, uh, you can see a photograph there. One of the things that happened to get the ADA passed was that um, a few dozen activists cl literally climbed up the steps of the Capitol on their elbows in order to, to show that it wasn't accessible and to demand passage to the, the ADA. And um, she was a little girl at the time, and um, Annette Babe Hemental wrote a book about it that's a children's book that's really phenomenal. But putting that as one pathway to understand this, along with photographs, along with film, along with speeches, legislation, timelines. The idea is to give students a whole bunch of different ways and to give the teacher a bunch of different ways to come at this material. Um, some additional tools that we use are um, things like quartering an image. So students look at it in quarters and, and learn to do close observations giving students ways to express themselves by, for example, putting post-it notes with thought balloons saying, you know, what is this person who's waiting at Ellis Island? What is she thinking? What is, what is she thinking about her children, for example? Um, and we use a number of these structured um, protocols to help structure discussion um, so that all students can, can develop those, uh, those muscles of analysis. Um, we offer the information in many cases on multiple levels. So there's um, a slide uh, about Judy Human in the elementary program. There's a longer um, description that either the teacher might read or some students might be able to read themselves. Um, and um, as I said, there's one lesson that just focuses on doing inclusive civics projects um, and one thing I want to um, uh, point out is that the learning goals for self-advocacy and the learning goals for doing civic engagement are very, very similar lists. So there's an opportunity for a conversation between special education and the civics teachers, social studies teachers. Um, and in at least one case I know of where they took that to another level and the, um, the teachers uh, developed a learning goal with the student of demonstrating an understanding of what my learning disability is, communicating to, to others what I need to learn. And in this case, the student's civic project was to develop a slideshow for peers and others to talk about his autism and to explain I'm doing this so I can end stereotypes and assumptions that people make about people who have autism. So the civics project actually addressed a number of goals there. Um, I wanna point out some uh, resources that are available to you in addition to this curriculum. Uh, we have a thing on our Emerging America site called the Accessing Inquiry Clearinghouse that has all sorts of 
resources, particularly for history social studies, on how to make it more inclusive. Uh, our most visited page on the website is a page on universal design for learning framed in terms of the social studies, for example. Um, and um, I want to, uh, as I said, we're going to give you these slides. Um, there was an article that appeared recently that summarized this emerging movement to teach disability history quite well. Um, and so there's a link to that. It was published on GBH Television's website. Um, and I want to point out that um, there was a chapter in a book that just came out this month um, about um, all of these strategies. So any of you who are teaching teacher ed courses in particular might find this a really useful um, chapter um, to assign to students. Um, and um, I want to invite uh, any of you who would like to join us. There's a group that gets together every every other month to talk about these strategies. Um, and you can send me an email at rkaren at collaborative.org if you want to join us this Thursday. Um, we're going to be um, meeting. Um, and of course, uh, the LDA is, uh, as I said, is a great uh, partner. I encourage everyone, if you're not a member already, um, please do join. Um, and Ross. All right. So um, thank you once again for uh, attending. Um, we wanted to kind of put the question to you. Um, we're hoping that you were able to identify one or two things that, that you can take away from this material uh, to integrate into teaching history and empower your students. So please post, take a, a, a moment to reflect and post in the chat. And just a reminder uh, of the four pathways that we identified, so teaching history directly, facilitating discussion of disability identity, uh, supporting integration in history and humanities, and advocating for school and district policy. Please take a moment to think, reflect, and uh, put in chat. So we're going to be quiet so you can do that, but I am looking at your questions and Please feel free to add questions. So um, someone asked, um, at what age do you think education about disability history should occur? Um, students understand a lot more about history than we usually give them credit for. Um, and so certainly by kindergarten, um, a book like All the Way to the Top, uh, there's, there's some really good books about um, disability identity that can work with, with very young children. Um, and um, I have three grown children that have various types of learning disabilities. I don't remember them ever being taught about ADA or any disabilities. Does any school do this? You know, it's happening partly because teachers are saying that they want to, but it's also, it's happening. I just got an email today from um, a teacher who said, three of my students came to me and they, they want to do a project on this. Uh, what what do I do? Um, so it's, it's increasingly students are stepping up and young adults. Um, how would a person get the school to even consider this? Um, in several states, it's mandated, um, but the states aren't really providing much support. Um, but more importantly, Ross really talked about the, the motivations of uh, engaging students. And I think talking to any peers um, uh, would be uh, a, uh, a great way to, to get peers to think about this. I think that when special education has a conversation with social studies, that you get the richest work because a lot of social studies teachers want to do more and don't know how. Um, so um, the webinar on Thursday is also from five to six Eastern time. And again, just send me an email. The email went in the chat. Um, I am going to put the um, evaluation uh, we have a, a short evaluation where you can give us input on this um, webinar. And believe me, we do look at that um, and take it very seriously. Like, uh, 
So um, that in the second, um, uh, I like the idea of using picture books. Uh, you know, don't just use them with first graders. If you're a first grade teacher, great. But even high school students can really get into a good picture book, um, particularly if it introduces the concept as well as some of these do. Um, how are English language learners included in this curriculum? Very good question. It's one of the reasons why we use universal design for learning as the key organizing strategy. Um, and our work at Emerging America has also included English learners throughout the years. Um, there's some very important differences and distinctions between the two different, uh, the needs of, well, of every student, but um, a lot of these tools and techniques are also going to help students um, who are learning English to have conversations, um, to be doing the, the intellectual work that they need to to learn language as well as the, um, the history. Um, and um, how are we doing on time here? Uh, I work with elementary students. think this could be helpful to teach students understanding of people's needs and differences. Um, yeah, glad to see someone uh, going to go check out all the way to the top. Um, I believe it's important to teach disability history directly and especially teaching how to use words with respect. Teaching through picture books for elementary and higher level uh, is a way to engage students in learning about disability history of our country. Um, can we share the recording of this webinar with others? I'm going to let Cindy answer that, but I assume the answer is yes. Um, yeah, that that's fine. Um, I'm actually going to just check. Everybody will get a, a an email of the recording. I'm not what I'm not sure of is if it will be restricted to your email address that you registered under. So you just may need to provide whoever you want to share it with with the registration information that you used when you signed up. Um, but that'll be clarified in the email that goes out. Uh, someone said, I was going to, to uh, say, use the representation that disability history provides to engage the classroom with the material. I think, again, give students credit for uh, being um, able to wrestle with ideas and um, to really help you figure out how to, how to put this to work. Um, and uh, someone asked, would, be, would we be willing to share with other groups? Um, again, email us. Um, uh, and probably the easiest at this point would be to email me. Um, Ross is a classroom teacher, so I have, uh, it's easier for me to check my email and then we do consult uh, frequently. Um, and uh, Ross, do you have anything else you wanna say? We're, we're closing in on the... So on the topic of engagement, um, a number of people have talked about um, how they're going to use this. Um, so one, I think one great tip that I think Rich has given at other talks is if you don't teach, if, if you teach in the classroom, you can bring a primary document and an image like from uh, immigration or um, a disability rights movement image uh, to put up next to a more commonly like the African-American civil rights movement, you know, just start the conversation small, right? Um, you know, use an image or a source um, and get this conversation going with your students and then, you know, build on that. Um, someone asked a really great question about, does the curriculum expose all the hurtful words to describe individuals since the beginning of recorded history? Absolutely not. Um, the terms are going to come up when you're looking at the, this really lovely, otherwise lovely image of the, the school for the deaf, um, you need to be ready for how to address that. Um, and, uh, you know, you're looking at legislation and it uses offensive terms. Um, so you have to, you have to know when you're going to have to, you know, it's unavoidable, but, um, there's no reason to drag students through any, more trauma than than uh, is unavoidable if you're going to look at, at look at the topics. Do you have anything else to say about that classroom teacher who actually does this on a daily basis? Um, well, we are at the end of our uh, 
of our time. Uh, Ross and I uh, both agreed. We're happy to stick around, particularly if you have somebody has a question maybe that you weren't comfortable putting out to everyone. Um, thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you for the work you do. Ross, any final words? Yeah, I guess just to echo Rich, thank you for um, taking the time to uh, to kind of learn with us, right? And I hope uh, you're able to bring some of this um, and um, use it to further the work. And uh, Cindy uh, is going to send out the uh, email with the uh, link to the recording. Um, and also, um, we can include the slides, um, a link to the slides, because they're they're big. So I don't think we want to email them out to everybody, but we'll put them on a website so you can, on a Google site, so you can go find them. Cindy, do you have any last words? Uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Every time I... I see one of these presentations from you, Rich. I always learn something new, so really appreciate it. And I think it's really important work. And I thank everyone who joined us today because um, I think it's important to get this out there. All right, as we say, we're happy to stick around if people have additional questions. Someone had a, it looked like maybe it was meant to be a statement about the curriculum, but if that's a question, um, Please feel free to. All right. Um, uh, someone asked if the curriculum will be emailed to. I don't think the curriculum will be emailed, but that is available on your website, correct? Uh, it's at the um, follow the curriculum button from our website, and um, the, it's called Reform to Equal Rights. You could probably Google it. Um, <laughs> it would probably come up. Um, but yeah, it's all available free online. Um, it's 23 lesson plans with the unit plans and things. So it's not something we can send out, but we can send out the link. And the, the version that you see on our website is absolutely current. I made additions to it today. Okay, I think that's it. I have not seen any additional questions coming in. It looks like most people are dropping off, so we should be good. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Uh, someone says, um, even though people with disabilities are the largest uh, group in America of uh, people who are advocating for their rights, um, a lot of times they're relatively, we're relatively ignored. Um, and uh, so I, I think there's some growing frustration and involvement in political organizing because of that. Um, I think that's that's becoming a, becoming a clearer thing that sometimes voting is a block on issues is a way to get attention. So we'll see. Um, as a, as a sometime historian or student of history, I know better than to make predictions. <laughs> All right, everyone, thanks so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, Cindy, bye, Ross.